Welcome to ABA On Call. Join myself, Rick Cabina. This is the maturing of our science that can be done. And Doug Kostowitz. It is so powerful to be able to convey numbers rather than the subjective nature of words. For thought-provoking conversation. Hey everybody, would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we will tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Hello everybody and welcome to ABA On Call. We have a very fun discussion today. I'm joined by my trusty co-host, Dr. Douglas Kostowitz. Doug, really it's full amazing name. to see you. Full I'm name. Being fa- I'm being fancy today. Okay, fancy's good. Fancy's good. And we have a second time guest. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I think Dr. Justin Page, welcome. Thank you. I think you are the first second time guest. Oh, wow. That's a big honor. Thank you. It yes, is. yes, it is. Thank you very much. And today we're going to be talking about uh, something that I think most people will find, not most, all people will find intriguing, which is ABA in games. And you know, in our past podcast, we talked about this from the perspective of what do we do as adults to play games? But we want to focus this more on looking at games in you know, how might they be used therapeutically? How might people in ABA use games? And we've invited Justin to our podcast because this is where he's working full time. He has great expertise in working with certain games. And that's what we're going to talk about. So, Justin, welcome. Thank and you. let's start off by, you know, just talking about, you know, games. When you think about games, you know, what are they? What are we talking about in terms of games? Yeah, that's a that's a big question. Um, I think we can define games in a number of ways. There's entertainment games, which a lot of people are familiar with, your computer games, Xbox games, PlayStation games. You're playing them for entertainment. The other type of games that I want to focus on in our discussion today is the idea of a transformational game. And to generally define that, the transformational game or a serious game is a game that is designed with the intention to change players in some way. Under the relevance of ABA, I would see that as building a skill or to change a specific behavior, to teach a skill, however you want to phrase that. And so transformational games is really what I have been focused on for a little over the past year and developing them with a wonderful team. Um, Okay. So transformational games, uh, the way you characterize that, what's an example of a transformational game? An educational game, a transformational game. One of the examples that I would like to use is one that we're developing now. And in this game, we have focused on a vocational skill, how to use a point of sale system. We've used gamified techniques, making teaching more gamified, using those things that we all know and love, reinforcement, really nice technology and graphics. And the goal or outcome of the game is to familiarize a person with a point of sale system and to accurately take an order from someone and also quickly take an order from someone. And so in this transformational game, yes, you can be entertained. It is more fun to play. It's reinforcing to play. But the goal or the outcome that we built around is to teach a point of sale system and how someone would interact or use that in the real world. So it's transformational in the way that it grows that skill. It provides a socially significant behavior change for the person that's playing it. Got it. Yeah. Now, just in these games, is this done? Do you see this as the individuals left to interact? with the game itself or will there be individuals helping that person interact with that game is this is that the goal or or is it both so great question it 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 can be both 
a game can be facilitated and be multiplayer, as we know from entertainment games. These games could be used as a tool that's uh, almost as a individual working process. So I'm giving you a game, I'm asking you to play for a certain amount of time, we're using this game, you're having fun, and hey, Justin, I'm done, let's move on to our next topic. So it can be thought of almost like working on a worksheet or another thing we use in education to build a skill. And so I could have someone standing close by providing prompts, providing that additional external support around the game, or if someone is able to just self-initiate with a game, we could leave them alone and allow them to play that game until support is needed. And I guess one extension of that is the is there the ability for another person to be in the game interacting with them, not just over their shoulder helping them making sure that they're interacting properly? Absolutely. One of the games that we're developing is around social skills. And so the idea would be it's either a facilitator, like a teacher or a therapist working with a client or a student or another person, or two people playing the game together. And the goal of the game, uh, the game is called Who Done It. You're looking for a uh, school mascot head that's been stolen. And so you're placed in a school. One person can only find clues in the natural environment. The other person can only speak to people in the environment. And so you can't win this game unless you both go collect your clues and then at the end of the game, communicate with each other um, because you can't succeed of who took the head, where's the head stored. You both have halves to the whole. And so the game actually forces that communication and exchange of information and promotes that social skill to happen. And as we've play tested this uh, in special education departments as well as the clinic that I work at, we're seeing that not only is the social communication coming from, hey, I want to win the game, but also around, hey, this is fun. I'm playing a game. What do you think about it? So it's getting to that outcome that we're looking for in two separate ways, but kind of ending at the same path, which is really nice. So these games you're talking about, it sounds like, the, I mean, of course, you're talking about developing these games. Yes. So obviously, these are video games. These are games that are consumed... Uh, iPads, computers, and, and, and different video devices, is, is that uh, where your focus of games has been? Yes. Yeah, so working with SimCoach Games is the company I'm acting as a subject matter expert, and we're looking across platforms, really goal-centric. So what do I need to teach, and then what format is the best way to teach that? So we have games for the iPad or tablet. We have PC-based games, and we're working in VR, mixed reality, and AR as well. So we have this spectrum of games that teach different skills in different areas. One hypothesis I have is that as you practice pre-training a skill, maybe learning strategy or early prerequisite skills, a device such as a tablet or PC is very good for that. However, what the games can lack at that point is the generalization, putting it into the real environment a system like VR or AR begins to really allow for that where I can immerse someone in a surrounding environment with AR, where they're seeing their own environment, or with VR, immersing them into a replicated environment that they would be using the skill in and allowing them to practice in something extremely similar to promote that generalization when you go out into the real world. Wow. You know, I don't want to jump to our, our third segment, but you're, you're really pulling me there when I'm you're sorry. talking about virtual reality <laughs> and augmented reality. I mean, talking, thinking about the future is just so exciting. I was at a conference maybe a month or two ago, and at this big conference center, there was another conference going on, hmm. which was the toy conference. And I got to tell you, this was one of the best, like I just snuck in and walked, walked around. And it was so amazing because what these people were doing is they were selling to like the vendors. So in your community, if you've ever been to one of those shops, like toy shops, you know, those people that want to figure out what's the new kind of toy mm -hmm. would be at this uh, convention. And uh, as I was walking around, I saw a lot of people that had really cool games. And I was struck by how many cool just board games that yeah. there are out there. So I was thinking, you know, these transformational games that you're talking about is probably much easier to get these things 
uh, shared because like anybody that has a device could just could use it. Mm -hmm. But your ideas and what you're saying about these transformational games could easily be changed into like a board game or if not a board game, just like a role play or whatever. Right. I would think that that would be possible also. Absolutely. And what I've seen working with a professional game development team, they will storyboard sometimes in a board game format or card format or role play out rules as you would for things like Dungeons and Dragons, a typical role play game, and then build that first and then move it to a video game format. And so it's almost exactly that, Rick, of you, you're kind of pulling those concepts and if you want to talk about gamification, that gamification using those principles that are there in a board game or something like that, and then building that video game around not only the goal that we have set out to, to teach the skill, but also we've, we've kind of play tested it ourselves with this board game or some cards, something really easy before that effort goes into building that virtual world around it. Well, that brings us to our first secret word which is play. Second question for you. So how have you used games? So you talked a little bit about the attempt to use these games to help neurodiverse individuals. Yeah, very good question. It, it's emerging. So one of my roles right now, working as a subject matter expert with SimCoach Games, the other hat that I wear is clinical director at Step One Neurodiversity Services here in Pittsburgh. So we have a clinic and we are deploying some of these games with our BCBAs in our clinic and getting them into the hands of kids with written behavior plans, written goals that we're actively working on. With the intent really that these games aren't replacing therapy, they're not replacing ABA or anything like that, but they're used to support and enhance. And that's my view on it as we're getting into therapy. There are certain things that a behavior analyst is gonna do in therapy and ABA that I probably can't get or capture in a game fully. But there are some skills that lend themselves really well to gameplay. And with the use uh, of technology and the accessibility, even my daughter, who's five, she knows how to use an iPad, right? So these kids come with a preference to play games, use a tablet, use these things. So we're meeting them at a preference level and a reinforcement level too of, hey, do you wanna sit across the table from Justin and work with cards? Or, hey, do you wanna play on an iPad for a little bit and we'll teach that skill that way? So we have been able to bring in things in some of the games that we have of not only tools to support the behavior analysts, but also games that identify emotion. We have vocational skill games that we've deployed and used. We've used a virtual card deck to allow for assessments and like a DTT as well to replace physical cards. So we're using it in a number of different ways right now in our clinic. And then also local school districts have invited us in and we've been able to work with special education. And so we're meeting the folks in the classroom and working with them there as well. And those games range from our social skill games uh, like Whodunit that I mentioned we have a tablet game that teaches the concept of how to ride a bus. And so we've been able to play and use some of those as well that are a little bit higher level skills. I'm curious, you know, when we, when we talk about uh, neurodiversity and in, in people have differences, you know, we're mm -hmm. all three, we have a background in special education and we've all worked with many different people that have uh, different types of disabilities and that are neurologically diverse. So I'm curious is what's the scope of, of uh, people you've been working with? I'm assuming, you know, you said you had a, a clinic. So I'm assuming you work with lots of uh, children with autism uh, spectrum disorders. Uh, who else have you worked with? I mean, if you're in special ed classrooms, I'm assuming yeah. you've had a chance to work with lots of, uh, typically developing and uh, neurodiverse individuals. Yeah, absolutely correct, Rick. There, we've had a range of individuals, more so when we've worked in the community in special education settings. Uh, in the clinic, we're primarily working with uh, early intervention, maybe like middle school age is the uh, probably the oldest right now, 
a lot of ASD, some mild intellectual developmental disability as well. When we have moved into those special education programs, we've worked with people that have intellectual disability, I would say severe level, uh, mild, moderate. We've worked with people with learning disorders, some people with just that come to special education for support in one area, such as like a math class or reading or something like that. We've worked with um, emotional support as well. So we've had some students from emotional support and we've used some of these games. Uh, we've had the opportunity to have a few gen ed kids sneak over uh, at the same level to play some of these games. And again, because it's focused on a skill building, although we're identifying and, and trying to work with a neurodiverse population, that typical developing population as well can benefit from these games. Because again, it all goes back to just skill building and having fun while you're skill building. All right, so I got a technical question. What, with all of these behaviors, what kind of data are you collecting, seeing? Is this part of the techno? I mean, is it, are you able to then share? Can the children access? Care, or is it limited to who's helping them? You speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. So being a behavior analyst, loving data, that was something I pushed for really hard when we were designing these games. So not only on the skill-based outcome of like, hey, are we doing better? I can't say a behavior is doing better. We all know this, unless I'm tracking and seeing improvement with our visual analysis. The beauty about games is that on the back end, if I get to the developer soon enough, they can code that data collection in and so it becomes automatic. So I can measure success, correct, incorrect. We've measured latency of response. We've measured duration, uh, how many mistakes you made across levels across the entire time you played, how many times you asked for help. A few examples, because I think that would help center it a little bit more. With, with a game that we have called All in Register that looks at vocational skills, I can track how many times you have to ask someone to repeat an order before you type it in correctly. And I can look specifically where you're making mistakes on a point of sale system so that I could come in with an additional intervention at that time. So I can use that as an assessment almost, but I can also use it as a treatment as well. In addition to that, when you're building levels out, I can scale the difficulty and the prompts per level so I can get a really nice fade in of prompts or fade out of prompts and then increase that difficulty very systematically. And so you almost get into this habit of really good fidelity because the game does it the same way every single time. And with that data, I'm able to pull it back on our back end, de-identified, and that can go to mom and dad. It can go to special education. It can go to the child. Uh, it can go to their therapist in various forms. So when we talk about the consumption of data, us, single subject design. Hey, can we put it on a standard acceleration chart? Can I track it fluency? Yep, love to see that. But maybe for mom and dad, it's a, it's a bar graph or a pie chart. For a child, I'm giving them feedback after they beat the level of, hey, you got three stars. Here's how we calculate those stars. And so we try to give that immediate feedback per level for that person so they can see how they did. And we may, in some of our games, have specific feedback. Here's what you missed. And so that child could then go back and self-initiate and try to self-correct the next time they play as well. So we're putting data collection in multiple levels. So quick one, uh, you mentioned error correction. They can then see it. Do you have the ability to provide errorless learning that the answers immediately provide it? So you do have, so you can change that as well too. So one of the great things that we have come across that we're finding there was a recent lit review out that looked at VR. And one of the things that they said in that lit review was it's really hard to design multiple levels, right? So I could design 16 scenarios with our team, and then that's all I have. We're taking a much different approach as a facilitator view, so that as a therapist, as a special educator, whoever that role is, mom or dad, a guardian, I can come in and set the criteria, the bounds, the prompting, errorless learning, and I can set it and click play and hand it to the kid that's going to play. And so all of a sudden, I'm taking the burden in some way off of, oh, I got to uh, design 70 scenarios. I can put all my selections up front and design this interface, 
set all those things, errorless learning. Hey, we're going to do least the most prompting, right? So instead of the big arrow coming in and go like push here, maybe it's just a reminder. There's no reminder based on my uh, person's skill level. So I can meet them where they're at. And we found that this facilitator view is very helpful in our clinic. And it's been very appealing to special educators when we go out there because it's allowing access to a number of different kids for these games. This is what I love about the intersection of technology in ABA and games is everything you're describing involves collecting this data and then you can just do so much of it. You could compare it against different ages, different uh, people have, you know, disability categories. I mean, there's just so much you can do. And then also not just that, do the comparisons, but just the rapid iteration so you have to, of course, work with developers, like you said, but right. you are really in just this cool place. And I hope people in the audience that are listening can consider that, yes, ABA uh, can work with technology and you happen to be uniquely situated in, in that you're working with games. Uh, I did have one thought that I wanted to ask you about in terms of mm -hmm. your role. You talked earlier in a, our previous segment you were talking about a roadmap and I would love to know, you know, getting behind the scenes, how do you roadmap things out? Because yeah, in terms of games, you could literally create thousands of games. You don't have that kind of time. So how do you right. allocate uh, your precious resources between if you're going to create games, how do you figure out where they go and uh, you know, how, how you're going to move forward in the future? That's a really good question, Rick. And I have two answers. So at the, the early version and early iteration of this a year ago when I came in was just what games would you build? And I said, this is what I've seen in my clinical practice that is really hard to teach. It's really intensive. It requires a lot of support, a lot of like therapist power, special education power, where physical people are taking a lot of time to teach this skill. I'd like to start there. And we found for something like a vocational skill, Okay, here's our vocational sale, uh, vocational skill point of sale system. And then I go back to them and I say, you know, to get someone there, I really need to teach them about money and value of money and identification of money. And then it's like, oh man, okay. So here's 10 mini games about that. So I've, so I've kind of started with this overarching need and then I go back to maybe some prerequisite pivotal behaviors that I have to use to build to that or that are associated around that skill. Road mapping now, we're falling into this interesting pattern of umbrella topics, looking at assessment. And that I think that's a forcing function of the clinical role that I have in our clinic. We're doing so many assessments and intake. How do we make that process easier, better for not only the therapist that's going out to lessen that load, but also the client coming in and making that process more fun and easy. We're looking at early intervention, again, coming from, we have these younger kids. Uh, obviously there's a screen time cap of how, mu how much screen time kids should have. I'm not gonna put a four-year-old in a VR headset. It's fairly unethical. There's not, not good data about that. We're not advocating for anything like that. But looking at some of these things of, could we take sequencing and make a game about sequencing? That's fun. Yeah, we, we have a prototype about that called mag magician match, where someone has to learn a sequence and if they put the sequence in correctly, the magician does a trick. And so the reinforcements build in for them. We look at social skills because we're finding that, and we know from our science, especially with autism, that's a uh, symptom of autism is the challenge with social skills. So let's build games around that. We're looking at vocational games because oftentimes that's, again, sometimes really difficult to teach uh, especially with shortages of therapists and special educators, a game can help not replace them, but support in those areas where we maybe don't have enough staffing. And then again, parallel to that, I would say, life skills can be really challenging to teach. It can be hard for a parent. A lot of times parents are kind of left to do that or working really closely with a therapist to do that in the home, sometimes unsupported or only supported a little bit. And so putting that support where there's less support or scaffolding in place for them. That's where we're trying to target across those domains. Okay. Well, I think that brings us to the, our second secret word and that word is fun. Well, then that brings us to our last section and that is 
discussing the future of games, ABA, uh, being used with different people and beyond. And there's so much to talk about in here. Like I already, uh, I have many things i like to say, but I want to pick up on something you just said, Justin. And that was, we were talking about AR and you mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, putting a, a, or not AR, VR, putting a four-year-old in VR would be considered unethical. Sure. Would it? Because here's the thing, and, and I, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yeah. I have a granddaughter yeah. who's going to be two this year. And she, like, she's been using the iPad like a pro sure. for the last <laughs> four or five months. So even before she was two, she can swipe. She knows how to watch these things on YouTube. And it's really cute because now like she imitates and she'll go like, shoo. And sure. these are things clearly she's seen because there's so many like Miss Rachel and all these yeah. other influencers that do things. And so she's watching these things and she's benefiting from these things. And there's a lot of games and apps that could be developed that could help her. I'm not yeah. saying they're out there right now. And then when you think about VR, and again, I'm not advocating we put you know, like yeah. a little emerging person, but I just think these are things to think about. And what if the benefit was so great, you know, like ready player one, is everyone right. going to move that way? So right. there's just a lot to think about. And like, I don't, I don't know the answers and I'm not going to put you on the spot here, but I do want to discuss these issues and think about as we look at games and as we look at uh, putting our hand in, because ABA has to have be on the stage, a, not the stage, yeah. uh, a place at the table. I we agree. have to be working with developers like you're doing, which I find just wonderful. And we have to be influencing things because if we don't, then all we'll be able to do is complain about the stuff that's out there, and you know we'll be outside observers rather than helping you know, captain the ship. Right. I think with VR, AR, where our technology is now. You think about things like eye strain and that impact of having that screen. The recommendation that the team gives to me right now is really you should spend 30 minutes in, in VR headset and then you take a break. That's the recommendation. And so part of what, why I said that's unethical and maybe that's a strong stance to put a four-year-old in, in VR is there's not a lot of medical data about that. Um, and so putting that screen against someone's eyes and, and, and putting them in there I don't think people do that a lot. And so there's not a lot of data to look at the eye strain, the eye pain, and things like that. So that's why I made that statement. I really like, Rick, what you said about ABA has to have a place at the table. One of the things I noticed as we're introducing gaming and video games and technology into the clinic and the practice and the behavior analysts that I'm working with, we're, we're kind of really lacking in the field in, some, in, in this way. I walking through the clinic, what are we using? We're using flashcards. We're using printed things and cutting them out for tokens and all these things. And then I'm like, hey, instead of a card deck, why don't you try this virtual deck that we've made? And all of a sudden, I just want this, Justin. Just put more cards in this. I don't want to use the old cards anymore. Okay. There seems to be this kind of lack of technology or this lag of technology being introduced around therapy. I think we have a lot of like data collection systems and things like that, but to actually put in the skill building to working that direct interaction with someone, we're really using older things that we're very familiar with. I think that have been tried and true tested. And so to put something new in, there's a lot of excitement around it. And we're finding in some ways there's a preference both for the therapist, but also the client that we're working with too. And obviously we need to research that. And we can have a whole discussion on that because I'd love to do mm -hmm. that. And we're spinning that up as we speak. But I do see that as we're, we're, missing, we're missing that in our field, that kind of technological jump where these other fields are kind of progressing in. We're, we're kind of lagging behind there in my opinion. Yeah. I want to go back to something you said in the last part of this, uh, how you said you, you, how you decide what to target. And you said that you initially looked at things that were hard. Mm -hmm. And then once you got the point of sale, you found out, Hey, I need all these pivotal skills of turning to mini games. Do you see as you come up with more games that target more skills? 
Do you feel like these mini games will begin to overlap and may overtake those endpoint skills mm. when you're identifying these core element skills that are so necessary across that broad spectrum, as you mentioned, with that umbrella? And now it's something that's required and missing for so many kids, perhaps maybe. Uh, some of the neurodiverse populations that you spoke about earlier. I I guess, do you see that happening as you come up with, rather than games for skill, games that cover all these? Yes. So I think that's challenging to have the the kind of white whale of the ultimate game that that touches so much. We We have tried to build some games that cover a lot like a spectrum of skills. And what, we've, what we have found initially, and I think part of it is our iteration process, we're getting better as we're building these games. But if we begin to target a lot in one game, we lose sight of what's the goal. There's five or six goals. And so if we can scale that down, and I'll use our, and Doug, I believe you've seen this game, our next stop, it's a how to ride the bus game. And the idea behind it is, the strategy of riding a bus. So it's it's played on a tablet and you start with planning a route. And so you're given a target, you tap to measure to the target, and then you're at the bus stop and you have to select the correct bus. And then you're on the bus and then you have to pull the string to stop the bus at your stop. And you can self-monitor. You can say, oh, look, I'm two stops away. I'm one stop away. Pull the string. I stop. Directly, those skills don't translate to the real world, right? I'm not gonna pull the string by going like this. I can't just click a stop on my iPhone and then I'm teleported there. However, that strategy of, I need to plan where I'm going. I might have to plan a line change. I have to find the right bus and discriminate between the bus. Those sub skills or pivotal skills that you need to ride the bus, we've put a handful in all around and try to contextualize it. So when you're talking about, is there a way that we could hit all the skills? We've been kind of grouping skills together of what gets us to the goal, the contextualization of if I'm actually riding the bus, I have to have these decisions and I want to be able to have a behavior around that decision. And that's touching the screen, making the choice and moving forward that way. I think it's, we have found it's really difficult to make just a broad game that teaches everything. We have some really cool mini games that are coming out that are around superlatives, like more or less, uh, behind and front. And they're just simple, you play the game. I'm um, gonna have to land the helicopter in front of something, to the left of something, to the right of something. And so we're learning all that and it's just a quick little game and then that skill goes away. And then I'm playing a pancake game where a stack of pancakes drops and it says, you know, find in between. And so I have to look and go, okay, there's six here and two here. I need a stack of pancakes between six and two. It's a fun little mini game, and I play that, play that. Okay, I've practiced that skill. I can move to the next one. So you can get some quick gameplay too, and it doesn't have to be hours and hours long. It can be, hey, I'm going to play this for five minutes. I'm going to learn some stuff. Great, and I can come back to it and make it harder uh, or easier, depending on the level that we're going after too. Did that answer your question, Doug? I don't know. I rambled a bit there. Well, you know, I I wanted to just hear your thoughts. Uh, <laughs> I I was thinking. Not so much the game that will solve everything, but identification of certain skills. So mm. point of sale, you need to know about money. Yes. There's a ton of skills out there that involve money. Mm -hmm. So if you're going down the path of money, you know, we invest our time in teaching about money. That would influence all my behaviors across all those. Correct. That's what I was saying, like, you start, you may start to identify groups of skills that go off to so many other, and that's not to replace those other games. Yes. That this, we can invest a lot of time and energy to enhance the performance on these other games. Yes. I think we're doing that currently. Yes. The way, the way we've outlined and have been kind of geared towards is those pivotal skills on a tablet-based or PC-based game, 
and then increasing the complexity and getting the generalization through VR. And so the vocational skill game that you're talking about, we have the mini games. We're learning about money. We're learning about identification of money, addition and subtraction with money, counting, all those pieces, value of money. And then you play the point of sale system game on register. And that's just the point of sale system game. We're learning just about that skill. And then we're designing a VR game where now you're immersed and I am working in a cafe and I'm getting money and I'm working my point of sale system in an area that looks like you know, a pseudo cafe area that you might find in, you know, a Starbucks or a McDonald's or something like that. And so now we're getting into generalization and I'm using these skills and I can track that maintenance between each. So if I taught you down here, oh, now I can spot check against it over here in my VR environment too. I can collect that data as well. Now, I had a chance to visit you at the last ABAI conference yeah. when you were doing a poster. And my, this, this section is talking about the future of games and ABA. You had, you were showing people games. You were letting people play with games. I'm just curious, like I was with you for maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, but you interacted with many people. What was your sense of how just people that were stopping by and people who are, you know, our ABA colleagues, what were their reactions to the games you were showing them. So I think the, the first reaction was it's a game, it, blow it off. Right. And I, and I think that's, we have been conditioned of when we see video game, we're thinking super Mario, we're thinking Fortnite, we're thinking those entertainment games, the people that got over that initial hump and we're like, okay, show me. And I was able to explain, look what we've done. Here's our prompts and translating from the game, what's happening in our turn. All of a sudden I saw the light bulb go off. I had other colleagues that came in and were like, wait, you can teach a skill with this game? Show me. They, the, the investment was there. So it was a very interesting mix of some people I had to really convince that, just come take a look and let me walk through it with you. Other people were like, could I take that iPad that you have and just play for a bit? Absolutely, right? That's the fun of the game. Unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of data at that ABAI for that poster. However, as we've been collecting data, I'm really hopeful in some future conferences to bring that data and actually show like, hey, look, we built a skill here and we probed it. Um, and so I'm very excited for that. I had some behavior analysts that are like, hey, I want to reach out. Can you get me this game? <laughs> like, I, I want that tomorrow in my clinic, in my kid's hand, um, which was just really exciting to see, too, because it, it confirms a little bit that we're on the right track, uh, which is always really good to hear. If people are like that behavior analyst and they want to learn more or possibly purchase games, is that possible? Like where would they, where would they look up information from what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sim coach games. That's uh, S I M C O A C H uh, Sim coach games. You can jump on that website and reach out. Um, we are licensing games and in the process of launching games. Uh, hopefully soon we're going to have some games just available on the app store. So you can just download and grab. Um, we're looking for partners that want to do, uh, do a partnership and a trial and just kind of look and see, uh, both in special education environments, so different school districts, uh, as well as clinics and different areas, too, that are very interested. So that is available. They are absolutely welcome to reach, reaching out to me as well, uh, and I can provide that for the show notes, uh, my contact information. But, yeah, we, we're in the process now of... Um, going through production and at a point where we're just putting the final polish on some of these things and they're going to be ready very soon uh, for deployment in a number of ways. All right. Well, I think that brings us to our final word and that is games. Doug, you came up with some good secret words here. Did I come up? I pitched. Oh, maybe I did. Okay, cool. <laughs> this talk went way too fast as usual. Fascinating. <laughs> Uh, great content and very glad to to hear about what you're doing. And I, I really, uh, you know, Doug and I have been in the field for quite some time and, and we, we both are in love with the field. You know, uh, no science, especially in applied science is perfect, mm -hmm. but it's just great to see how our field just keeps evolving 
you know, we keep doing research, but yet we're moving out, we're branching out into these other things. And that just uh, swells, swells some pride there and also just makes me very happy to, to see what's going on and what's possible. So with that, I thank you very much for your time. And I thank all of you for joining us. Thanks for watching this episode of ABA On Call. To get your CEU, follow the link and instructions below the video. You can enjoy the program again there, or you can go straight to the attendance verification quiz. Just enter the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate.